Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Tuesday evening fireside chats. Today, we're going to have the opportunity to chat with Mackenzie Davis, who is a triathlete, Ironman finisher, including Kona, an ultra runner, including a DFL, a Bigfoot 200, and a race director. So bring your questions, type them into the little box at the bottom under the comment or the little question mark on the right hand side and I'll make sure I get to them. Before I bring McKinsey on, uh, just a couple of uh, items of note. One, for the ladies out there, a reminder that the Monarch Triathlon Super Half is coming back. It'll take place in Kingman, Arizona on September 30th. Um, and it's a point to point event that includes swimming downstream in the Colorado River, riding up and over Union Pass, and then running in Kingman uh, and finishing under the Route 66 arch. So don't forget that. Also, there are discounts for you at uh, in our digital magazine, which you can get by signing up through our newsletter, which is through the link in our bio. It'll get delivered right to your mailbox. Plus, um, we promise to only send you two emails a month and with those two emails a month, you will get articles from athletes doing extraordinary things, as well as discounts, as well as upcoming guests on our fireside chats. So without further ado, let me get McKinsey on our, our show so that we can chat with ultra running, including race directing as well. And, and, you know, most importantly, looking forward to the story with regards to finishing uh, DFL at Bigfoot 200. Perfect timing. Hi, hey. Good, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you for the invite. <laughs> yeah, so I gave the audience a little bit of a background on who you are, literally saying you are a triathlete who has competed in Kona, an ultra runner who has finished dead last at Bigfoot 200, and a race director. What else do we need to know about you before we jump into the conversation? Um, I guess I'm just a hardcore adventurer. Like right now I'm doing a lot of just crazy hikes in the snow and trying to bag some peaks during the winter and just see what I can do and enjoy all the snow. So not awesome. too much more than that. <laughs> when, when, when did you get started in endurance sport and why? Uh, uh, I started, so I started with like the sprint and Olympic triathlons, um, just coming out of high school and um, watching my family do like endurance sports. My dad is, I saw him do a 50 miler up in the Tetons and you know, it's been inspiring just to watch like the endurance and see how people push themselves and, um, you know, just growing with the distance and seeing what I can do and try to explore where my limits are at. And so far I haven't found them. So <laughs> keep going, I guess. You, you already answered the next question, which was going to be, did you find where that limit is? No, I haven't. So Ironman triathlete started with sprints and Olympics ultra runner have raced 200 milers which do you prefer and why oh my gosh if i could do another 200 or another bunch of 200s that would be so awesome i mean i learned so much from the 200 and it was such a grounding experience more so than like iron man's and i mean there's just so much there's so many cool things about trails that i i just love doing ultras so so for those those who are just getting started in either of those two sports, when you say, you know, the ultra and the 200 distance was more grounding, what do you mean by that? I got to know myself a lot more. Um, it was such a physical, mental, spiritual experience for me that I just, it was a all around great experience and learned so much about <laughs> my grit and, you know, yeah <laughs> when you got into triathlon you started with sprints and olympics so when you got into trail running did you start in road running and then get the trails or did you go straight to the trails and did you start at the shorter distance or were you like you know what the register button for bigfoot two, bigfoot 200 is here i'm pressing that um kind of so i my only 
trail race that I finished before Bigfoot 200 was Squaw Peak 50. Um, and it was actually my dad's idea to do Bigfoot 200. He's like, let's sign up for a 200. And I was like, are you crazy? I haven't even done a 100. But I was like, I guess let's do it. <laughs> so, yeah. Did your dad from... as well? What was that? Did your dad race the Bigfoot 200 as well? Yes. Yeah, so we started the race together, and then um, he ended up having to drop at mile 91, and then I kept going, and um, we both ran the last lap of the track together at Bigfoot, and it was a great experience. That's pretty cool. So you guys were together all the way through mile 91, no separation? So actually, we came into the mile 65 aid station. Um, our wheels had been falling off pretty bad, and um, to try to get some help, uh, I ran a little bit ahead of him. Um, we we're about like five or seven miles out, so I ran to the aid station ahead of him and tried to send like one of our pacers back to bring him in. So um, mile 65 is about where we kind of split and had to do our own race, so. So did you, were you guys sharing crew or did you have separate crew altogether? We, we shared crew. Wow. wow, so that's pretty tough on the crew members too then, right? Yeah, uh, they were actually trying to figure out like how long they could hold up this plan and they're just, they, my one pacer thought, oh, man, I might have to be running 100 miles instead of, like, her planned 60, 50 or 60 miles. So um, they basically just kicked the can down the road as far as they could until something changed. Very, very cool. So, <clears throat> excuse me, at Bigfoot 200, you finished DFL. And for those of you who don't know, it, that stands for dead fucking last. Tell us and help us understand your process through that race and before you answer i will it with this so we all go into races with goals and dreams and aspirations sometimes delusions of grandeur right i'm gonna finish in the top 20 or whatever so what were your goals heading to this event and how did they change as the event went along? oh my gosh um I had some pretty ambitious goals and I knew like going into these endurance races, like anything can happen. So I was like, man, 80 to 90 hours would be phenomenal. And then as the race went on, I was like, oh my gosh, like the cutoffs were like right on my butt after like 80 or 90 miles. And it was just like, okay, just try to get to the next aid station before the cutoff. And there was one where I was leaving the aid station with five minutes left before the cutoff. And they're like, yeah, get out of here. And I'm like, I just want to sleep. Like, I'm so tired. But man, it was a wild ride. Like, I did not expect <laughs> to be out there for 106 hours. So you <laughs> That it was about mile 80 or 90 into the event, right? That your process of, of thought started to change? I mean, when we came into the mile 65 aid station, I was a little hysterical and emotional. Like, uh, I don't know how much farther I can go. I was in a pretty dark, dark hole, <laughs> I guess you could say. Um, and... Yeah, you know, just trying to survive each section and take it in as it was. But eventually it turned into, okay, I might not make it to the next aid station before the cutoff, but let's see what we can give it. So I, I raced Cocodona in the inaugural year. Um, I don't know if you've heard stories, but the sections between mile 11 and 37 were probably some of the hardest and our goal like yours was to finish in about 75 76 hours that was this my delusion of grandeur and when we got to that segment like everything went out the window we were like 12 hours behind right then and there and so what sort of helped motivate me get through that process was thinking all of these people that came out here for crew for pacing and all of that stuff like i owe it to them to keep going so how did you pull yourself out of your dark places? What were some of the inspiring and motivational components to, for you to say, I need to keep going? 
Um, definitely at mile 65, I had that same thought, like all these people came out to support me. We've been training all summer long. I owe it to my pacer to at least give her a section to pace. And I felt guilty. Like I can't quit before she even can pace. Like everybody got work off. And so that was my first time, uh, digging myself out of the hole to just keep going as much as I could to, um, you know, give people a chance to pace because we're all excited to be there um and then there was another point uh i have to look at the course map because it all blends together but uh around mile ooh, 130 i was in another really dark place where i only had maybe three hours of sleep i've been up for 70 hours straight and was just getting so tired i did not really have anything in the tank. And I just laid up at the stars thinking while my pacer was looking around, kind of getting kind of antsy. And it's just like, I wonder what my actual odds are of finishing this race. Like this is really hard and I just don't know how much I can keep going. Um, and after I woke up from the nap, I mean, I was still in a lot of pain. My shin had been hurting since mile 46 and I still had another 50 or so miles to go um, and I got to this point where like was just walking to the next aid station to quit but um, you know I somehow that inner like mental battle started where I was like come on you need to do something different like because I DNF'd Ironman St. George a few months earlier I was like you have the chance to push it to the bitter end. You might as well do it until they pull you off the course. And so this, I don't know, 30 second wind, whatever you want to call it came and I was just fired up to, you know, get back in the game and just to keep pushing. And so we ran quite a bit of that. I mean, as much as I could for having an injury and running, a hundred miles on it at that point. Um, and, you know, just tried to keep, keep going through the pain, through the fatigue and my pacers were really helpful too. And, and trying to keep track of the pace and making sure we came in before the cutoff. So that was a lot of help too, because there's a lot of math going on during these ultras. Like, okay, what's the minimum pace that I have to do to keep in front of the cutoff? Because I was so close to the cutoff so many times. But yeah, I mean, there are a lot of, a lot of dark places. <laughs> in that race. It's amazing how quickly you become a mathematician at some of these events where you start calculating math. I raced Lake Sonoma, I got to mile 37 and I was like, just beat down. It was so hot. And I did the math in my head. If I walk the next 13 miles, 14 miles at this pace, I will finish under the cutoff. And that's what it became. Just walk because running was out of the question. It was too hot. I was dehydrated. It wasn't bouncing back. So it's funny how quickly you can become a mathematician when you need to in those scenarios. Yes. I mean, I did at the beginning of the race, but my pacers kind of had to do that for me because I was hallucinating and I was super sleep deprived. So my brain wasn't really working the right way. <laughs> Keep your urban running adventures going all winter long with high-performance traction designed specifically for icy roads. The Catula Nano Spikes footwear traction have a low-profile design that won't affect your stride while running. The 10 ultra-tough tungsten carbide spikes give you traction that you can trust. Don't let the ice and snow stop you from reaching your goals. For more information, visit Catula.com. So for those of you who are just joining us, Ahamundi, I am the founder and one of the co-owners of Run My Bike. We are chatting with Mackenzie Davis, who is not only a Kona qualifier and finisher at triathlon, she's an ultra runner and a race director. We're just gathering some stories right now about Bigfoot 200. If you have questions for Mackenzie, type them into the comment box or the little question mark on the bottom right hand side, and we'll make sure we get to them. Um, you said that you were, you realized where in terms of cutoffs, did you realize that you were also in the, in the DFL, the dead fucking last place at the time? So we started to get a better idea 
um, around mile 130 or so. And as the race went on, like as we got closer to um, the finish line, like we still had a lot of miles to cover and we passed a lot of people that were also struggling really hard. And I knew how much the cutoffs were on my ass that I was like, if I pass these people, they're in big, big trouble. Like it was, I, I mean, we tried to pull people with us, like, come on, join us. Like, let's go, let's go. Um, and you know, people, if they don't have the energy to keep going, you know, it's just, it's time. But yeah, I, I heard that some people were calling me the grim sweeper that like, as soon as I passed them, they would drop and like, I didn't try to be last or anything, but I mean, they would either, you know, miss the cutoff or pull themselves from the race. So, I mean, we tried really hard to pull people with us and keep them going too. Did that, if you had an idea of where you were in terms of and last, did that have an impact on you positively or negatively? Did you embrace the idea that you might be the last place finisher of the event and just be like, I'm still a finisher? Oh, yeah. I mean, there was no, I, I didn't feel bad or anything about being last because I was like, I freaking survived this thing. Like, there are so many people that, you know, the race didn't work out for them and they wish they could have finished the race. So I'm just grateful for the finish. And, you know, like in Ironman, the last place finishers, they get like the biggest crowd because it's just down to the wire to finish the race. And, you know, being within 50 minutes of, 107 hour cutoff is kind of insane so yeah i mean i was pretty stoked and i didn't realize that destination trails would do a shout out but i was like oh that's so cool and i look like a wreck but that's okay <laughs> the people that finished in 72 hours or whatever they look like a wreck too so no, no shame for that. And, but they're still like walking around and like having a good old time i was almost a zombie like five minutes after the finish line uh electricity like turned up i mean yeah Ugh. I was did zombie. you have an appetite when you finally finished were you like i am so hungry give me all the food or were you like i can't do anything um actually i think i had like a small kind of dinner but um throughout the race i didn't eat like anything so i feel like my stomach kind of shrunk and i was just like i'll just have a few snacks and just so tired that like my eyes were half open and i was just like ready to take a nap and not be pushed out of the chair to go to the next <laughs> station our uh, so om joined us here uh from india and he said that he was there and he can't he's gonna tell all his kids the story about your bigfoot <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> How exciting. So help us understand and compare what qualifying and finishing Kona meant in comparison to finishing Bigfoot 200. Are there, are there comparisons? Can you? Are they just two different stories? Man, I feel like they're two different stories because I have never had to dig so deep to keep going, like just to get to the next aid station. Um, at Bigfoot, there were so many moments where I was like, I don't know if I can finish. I, I don't know what my odds are of finishing, maybe 50% or so. And I never got to that point with Ironmans. Like, I knew that I was going to finish unless, like, I had a drastic mechanical problem with my bike or I could, you know, there's enough time to walk the marathon and still make it most of the time. Ironman St. George was a different story, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, it's, it's really crazy just grinding yourself into the ground for four days versus 17 hours. It, it really is eye opening, like, like what you can do and like how hard you have to dig to just finish the race. So you mentioned how finishing Bigfoot 200 changed your life. Did finishing Kona, which is obviously the pinnacle for Ironman and triathlon, change your life in that moment in comparison to what you experienced with your life-changing experience with Bigfoot? Oh, oh man. I mean, I think Kona was um, a great experience. It was so awesome having my family um, make all the sacrifice, like, 
being able to see the sacrifices that they made to be there and just seeing like all of their support was super great. Um, but as far as like learning about myself, Bigfoot 200 was a <clears throat> way bigger, I don't know, experience. And there were so many different situations that I had to problem solve to try to get myself out of a bad spot into a good spot. And uh, it was just a wild experience. <laughs> so you just mentioned um, DNFing at Iron Man George. Give us a little bit of background on that story. I have a follow-up question to that comparison to Bigfoot Kona and then at St. George. Sure. Um, so St. George was going to be my fifth Ironman. And um, I signed up for the race back in 2019, started training for it. It was supposed to happen in 2020, got canceled um, and then postponed till September and then got canceled again. So going through the brutal training blocks of just putting so many hours into three different sports uh, burned me out like beyond belief. And so when St. George actually happened again or was on the calendar to happen again, I was beyond burned out and I was decided I'm going to show up and just see what I can do. I only had a handful of swims um, under my belt and a few bike rides, but I just decided that maybe my trail running um, workouts will help me make it to the finish line, or maybe it won't, but that's okay. At least I'll go and see what I can do on little to no training. <laughs> um, but it was really exciting, like being able to move from St. Ironman St. George, and you know, I had the emotions and everything from dnf being like it was pretty sad and kind of daunting going into another race like oh i didn't finish this race i wonder if i'm gonna finish this one but bigfoot 200 was so big and different from what i've done that i was so excited to just get out and train and i had great people to train with and so that helped a lot so for those of you who are in the sport burnout is real Mackenzie just explained how she got burnt out. I DNF'd Ironman Wisconsin in 2019 myself because I was burned out too, trying to fit an Ironman race into the same season or year and finishing 100, including West States. Just by the time I got to that start line in Wisconsin, I threw like 25% of the swim. And I was like, this isn't fun. Like, I'm done with this. Pull me out. The training wasn't there the mind there. So burnout is a real thing for those of you who just get started in sports. So pay attention to it and, and understand that rest and recovery will help you progress through these sports. So how does the euphoria of finishing Bigfoot compare to the DNF at St. George? Is, is it, I'm a competitor and I will say this all the time, like I hate losing more than I enjoy winning. So is the DNF more soul crushing or was it in comparison to the finishing, the euphoria of finishing? So <clears throat> Ironman St. George, I, I had a feeling that, you know, a DNF was possible. I made it halfway through the marathon and couldn't stop throwing up in the gutter. Um, and, you know, I think I was just ready because it was, you know, the nail in the coffin for me, like it's, time to move on to another hobby for now. I mean, I say for now, I don't know if I'm going to come back to Ironman because I'm having so much fun on the trails, but um, having Bigfoot, being signed up for Bigfoot after the DNF, it was a little bit daunting where, you know, I DNF, there's, it's not fun. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of um, self-doubt that comes with it, but um, just if I had, had a choice like if I'd rather DNF St. George or Bigfoot 200 I would choose St. George a hundred times over um, because I mean in the grand scheme of things I knew that Bigfoot 200 was um, the race I was actually focused on and I was just wanting to get St. George out of the way be done swimming be done biking and just move on to another another adventure. So how do your experience at these events play into your role as the race 
character for the Unicorns Unleashed event? <laughs> um, so my first event that I put on like unofficially, and it was just for fun, a group of friends, um, we all got together. I put a course together for a 70.3 actually, and um, called that the Unicorn 70.3, but uh, moving over towards like the ultra marathon, uh, Unicorns Unleashed Ultras. Um, I know what I like at aid stations, but it's really great having a lot of friends and like a community to like pull from, ask them what they like um, at aid stations, what they like in a course, how to do the course marking. Um, so I try to, you know, just put what I like out there and throw everything else that other people like out there and hopefully they have a good time and then um, you know with the next year get ideas of how to make it better and just keep going from there just building it up. So do you have more, more um, empathy I guess for race directors now that you're putting on your own events in comparison to when you first started? Yes. <laughs> empathy for race directors um i don't think i feel bad for the runners anymore because i mean we do this to ourselves right <laughs> and just putting on a good event i think is really what's important and hope you know trying to help people have a good time and get out of their comfort zone but yeah i mean race directing is kind of a thankless job like they other race directors Directors put in so much work like I can't even imagine what Candace and Garrett like how much time and work they put in for their 200s I mean the races that I put on are only 13 hours 24 hours and then we're done and we all go home but yeah it's it's crazy there's a lot of work that goes into it so so, so is the unicorn unleashed franchise going to expand or you're you're happy with just having the event that you have right now <laughs> I'm good with just two <laughs> events right now. I've thought about a few different ones, but I don't know. Might have to wait till my full time job calms down a little bit. <laughs> Where do you think our sports go, right? Because at one point in time, the Ironman Kona was sort of the pinnacle of endurance sports, with trail running not having as much popularity, and then trail running more popular and Western states, as we can see through the lottery processes, you know, hugely popular. And then came the, the 200, the 250s with Cocodona. Where do you, like, are we going to continue to see, you know, a 300 mile event, a 400 mile? Like, are we going to continue to see, like, longer, or do we kind of revert back and go to faster and shorter? Um, I've seen there's like an 800 race in Finland or Norway or something. I don't think that's as popular, but I do think that the 200s might be the pinnacle. I mean, the triple crowns or um, what is it uh, where you do um, Cocodona 250 and then the other 200s from Destination Trails. Um, Same type of I, yeah, I think that's going to be, as far as I know or can gather from the trail community, I think that's basically the pinnacle of trail and ultra. Yeah, I could see that, you know, in the United States, people capping it out at 200, 250 miles, maybe trying to accumulate more, more than one within a season as opposed to, you know, this point. So I'm going to read a quote that I read your Instagram account, and I want to get your thought on what that quote means to you. So, um, wrote, there's no glory in climbing a mountain. All you want to do is get to the top. It's experiencing the climb itself and all its moments of revelation, heartbreak, and fatigue that has to be the goal. Karen Kusama is, is the, the person who said that quote. What does that quote mean to you now that we've talked about Kona and Bigfoot? Yeah, so, um, like I've kind of talked about before there's a lot of struggle and we learn a lot from ourselves through our struggles like if we won everything got to the top of every mountain I don't think we would learn as much about ourselves about like what it takes um to finish these races I mean you don't I'm 
there's that whole thought behind like, are you, um, oh shoot, my words are leaving me right now. But um, if we didn't fail at anything, are we really pushing ourselves? So uh, there's a lot to get from struggling and failing and learning from our failures. And I think failing forward is a huge thing because you know, I also DNF'd a 50 miler right before the 200. And I was like, I don't even know if I can finish a 200 because I didn't even finish a 50 miler. But I learned a lot from that race. And I think we can learn a lot more from failures than successes sometimes, because if everything came easy, where, where would we go? Like it just, we wouldn't try to keep pushing ourselves and trying to be better or, you know. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm a teacher at the collegiate level, and I tell my all the time, failure is not terminal. It's just a building block to success. And it's an opportunity to learn to get better, and we should always be striving for that. For those of you that are just joining, my name is Jason Bahamundi. I am the founder and one of the co-owners of Run, Try, Bike. We're being joined today by Kinsey Davis, who is a triathlete an ultra runner and a race director. Um, the full conversation will be on our Instagram feed immediately after the conversation. Uh, tomorrow, if you want to wait, you can watch it on YouTube or our website. And then next Monday, it'll be on our podcast and all previous episodes of our fireside chats can be found on our website, YouTube. And we are working very uh, rigorously at getting all of our podcast episodes updated as well. So, um, I have another quote for you before we jump into our rapid fire questions. Um, you wrote in November, it's late November, to, so that you have a timeline for it. It takes hours or days to climb a mountain, only to be at the summit for a few minutes. Enjoy, a journey, enjoy the journey. Is that a mantra that you came up with in November after you climbed a mountain? Or is this something that you live by consistently ever from the beginning of when you started these endurance sports? Um, I found that quote, I think it's super applicable to, you know, any big race that we're training for. Um, it's true to every, every mountain that I climb, it takes so long to just climb and slog through those mountains and then coming down um, is usually pretty quick. Um, and, you know, in the grand picture or the grand scheme of things, um, we spend all these hours training and then um, the race is only a fraction of all those hours that we've already put into it and then um, even more specifically the finish line it's a pretty uh, quick scene compared to how long the races are um, so you know it's you got to enjoy the journey or else the racing the racing the races aren't going to be as fulfilling yeah they the, for me, the joy is in the journey. I am a, I'm a crier at finish lines. I, I fully admit that. And it's because of all the time and energy leading up to that event. The crossing the finish line is literally once, but the race may have taken you four days or, you know, 10 hours, 12 hours. And, and that include the four to five months of training. Um, for some people, a year's worth of training. And so the joy for, uh, for me is a training. It's something we tell um, beginner athlete at the time. What's what's next on your race schedule? Where will we go and start? Um, I think I'm going to tone it down a little bit and just do Run Rabbit Run um, 100 in September. Um, I'm actually going to be pacing my pacer from Bigfoot. She's doing Bigfoot. Um, I'm super excited for her because now we get to switch the roles and I'm actually kind of nervous because there's some pretty big shoes to fill. I mean, they did so awesome. So yeah, we're going to be training for Bigfoot all summer long. And that's, I think our big event. And then I'm just going to try to do a 100 and see how it goes, but not going to try to top Bigfoot 200 this year. <laughs> It's hard to top those 250s. There is definitely a, um, a finisher blues that comes across where I've done something just out of way out of my comfort zone, and I don't know if there's anything I want to do next at this point. I know for me, I'm finally going back to the starting line of a 100-mile race in 
uh, late at the canyons, and I haven't done that. I haven't done it since um, I finished Cocodona because I was like, man, that was an enormous effort. So good for you for taking off, pressing the reset button, and, and getting back to it all the time. Races will always be there. Yes. I mean, it's kind of hard because Bigfoot was so much fun that I was like, I want to do another one. When do I get to do one? But yeah, I think it's time to just let this year kind of be a easygoing year and we'll see what the future has in store. Awesome. So before we wrap up our conversations with folks, we'd love to ask them, you know, goofy type questions, you know, get some more personality. So when you're out running or bagging summits are you uh listening to music a podcast or anything at all um normally nothing because i'll try to have somebody with me um or a few people with me but if i am by myself i turn on 80s rock music and just jam out to the old school tunes what so what would be your favorite rock music? Oh man, there's there's so many good ones. I I don't know if I could pick. <laughs> I like to switch it up, so I'll just turn on like an '80s hits and just rock and roll from there. Well, as a, as a person born in 1973, I appreciate that you're listening to '80s music. <laughs> oh my gosh, I I don't know. I feel like I should have lived through the 80s because i love all the big hair the sparkles the bright colors like i wish i could have been a part of it <laughs> that part of a theme for unicorns unleashed make make uh, a contest giveaway for for 80s looking <laughs> yeah that's a good idea <laughs> what recommended reading uh you have for our followers if it's a book if it's a short story if it's a poem oh um, Man, I don't, oh, I don't read a whole lot. I mean, I really like the documentaries that um, a lot of the ultra runners are that put on. Um, Courtney DeWalter is one of my running idols. Like, she's so awesome. But anything that she has to say, any of her podcasts are great, and I would highly recommend listening to those. So if you're not a reader, and I really fall into that category as to I read one or two books here, uh, Movies or TVs, TV shows? Um, um, probably TV shows. I have rewatched The Office. I don't know how many times I've rewatched Friends a million times and New Girl. So I just love how quotable and kind of silly they are. They kind of have a lot of different <laughs> themes that go on. So very yeah. cool. So, what's your favorite topping on? Pizza? Sorry, can you say? Say that again what's your favorite topping on pizza uh meat <laughs> sausage probably or pepperoni awesome so are you a fan of pineapple on pizza yay or nay yeah oh told you to <laughs> i don't know why people hate it I mean, pineapple and uh canadian bacon are so great <laughs> nope as a as a born and bred New Yorker, pineapple belongs nowhere near pizza. It belongs in a fruit salad. What? <laughs> Did Om tell you to say that he you like pineapple on pizza? What was that? Did Om tell you to say that you like pineapple on pizza? No. Oh, I love Hawaiian pizza. I, it's always a toss up between a meat lover's pizza and a Hawaiian pizza. So, What's your favorite, like right out of the oven hot pizza or the next day cold pizza? Um, I, I don't like cold pizza, but um, right out of the oven is good. But if it's the next day pizza, re heating it up um, after like all the seasonings get to like really get in there, it's, it's good. Both of them are good. <laughs> oh, oh, and that he said he did not tell you to, uh, <laughs> this, and I'm losing the battle. I just got to get more New Yorkers on the show. That's all. We'll, we'll, uh, I don't know. We might convert you sometime. No, you won't. Trust me. I'm going to be 50 years old at the end of this year. I will not enjoy pineapple. Oh, no. I, I saw a post on Instagram where you held out a Twix bar. What is your favorite candy? Um, Twix. Oh, man. I don't know. It's There's three. So there's Twix. 
Kit Kats and um, Reese's. And during Bigfoot, I ate Kit Kats and Twixes the whole time. And that actually helped me not be as emotional as what I could have been, so. What? During your Bigfoot experience, what was the strangest thing you wound up eating? Was there anything strange that you were like, I can't believe I ate that? No. I actually didn't eat a lot during Bigfoot. I think I actually lost like 15 pounds during that race or something. Cause I really only ate like peaches, candy and drink tailwind. I had a cup of chicken noodle soup like two or three times, but I definitely could have ate more. So, Should have actually. So for me, after like two or three days, I had like, these cold sores in my mouth from all the sugar. And so I couldn't do anything. And I made old meal mush that I just squeezed out of a Ziploc bag for the rest of the race. Like take instant oatmeal, put it in a Ziploc bag, add water, and just ate that for the rest of the race. I would never eat that ever again unless I was in that situation. Yeah, that sounds kind of crazy. Kind of gross. <laughs> <laughs> it, so back to the candy question. Is candy corn a real candy or is it just earwax with sugar? Wow. I, from how you phrase it, I think I know how I should answer, but I like candy corn. Any sugar is really good. It's kind of bad. Maybe that's why I have to run so much. <laughs> Are peeps a real candy or just a marshmallow dust ball? Um, a marshmallow covered in sugar, but I'll still eat it. <laughs> So do you eat them right, right out of the package, or do you let them sit on the counter for a day to, to get petrified? Oh, actually, my father-in-law has um, freeze-dried them, and they're really good that way. We've had guests on who have said that they like them, like, old and stale, that they're better old and stale than, than fresh out of the pack. I could see that. <laughs> Circus peanuts, the little orange things, are those a real candy or are they uh, things that your packages come packed in? Um, candy, I like them. You love sugar, clearly. Really? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> are you a pie or a cake person? Oh, probably cake. So is red velvet cake a f real flavor or is it just chocolate cake with red dye? Uh, probably chocolate cake. I don't know. I don't eat it that often, so I don't know. I think it's just chocolate cake with red dye. I mean, people love the yeah. butter, but you can get buttercream on, on carrot cake, you know? It's not. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of Texas trash pie? No, I don't know what that is. So it's chocolate chip pretzels, graham crackers, shredded nut, pecan pieces, condensed milk, and caramel bits. So it's. Is that a real pie or is it somebody who is just cleaning out their refrigerator one day, like all in one big pan? I mean, it sounds good, but I thought pies have to have fruit in them. <laughs> no. Uh, I guess there is a chocolate pie that I really like that chocolate. I think is a Marie Calendar pie, but that's just dessert at that point. <laughs> it's not a pie. <laughs> well, Mackenzie, thank you so much for joining us. Good luck to you as the at Bigfoot 200. Thank you participating at Run Rabbit. We look forward to following you on Instagram with the great quotes and the fabulous pictures of up and down snowy mountains. Um, if there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. We appreciate you joining us. Sounds great. Thank you for having me. It's been really great chatting with, with you and, you know, getting to talk about the experience and reflect on Bigfoot 200. Awesome. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.